Recording is on. Okay. Got it. Okay. Welcome uh, back. I'll introduce to yeah. So I'll introduce uh, Max Wilbert again. Um, uh, Max, Max, where are you? I am in Oregon right now, uh, where I live. I um, I've been in and out of Thacker Pass. Uh, for the last nine months, nine months plus now, but at the moment I'm I'm home taking care of some business here. And uh, tell us about this fifty thousand dollar fine they're trying to give you. Yeah, so the Bureau of Land Management hasn't been happy since the beginning about our whole plan to protect Thacker Pass. Um, they permitted the destruction of Thacker Pass. That's that, for people who don't know, I'll back up. The Bureau of Land Management, or BLM, is the federal agency that manages this public land where the lithium mine is proposed for. And they're, a, they're an agency like the National Park Service or the whatever, you know, Department of Agriculture. Um, they have their own uh, law enforcement, the Bureau of Land Management Rangers, uh, basically cops. And, uh, and they, they manage a large amount of land in the Western US. Um, I think it's around 20% of the entire land mass of the United States is managed by the BLM. And they, some people call them the Bureau of Livestock and Mining because that's what they do. They, they do a lot of uh, rangeland grazing management and they do a lot of mineral leasing to mining companies and oil and gas companies. Um, so uh, back in August, they started threatening Will and I, Will Falk and I, who started the Protect Thacker Pass camp to try and stop this massive open pit lithium mine. They started threatening us with fines and jail time for uh, for building what they say is trespass. Um, and they say that we're trespassing because we built or some basic latrines were built. I actually didn't personally build them or tell somebody go build that latrine. Uh, nonetheless, they're coming after Will and I for it. Um, for these la basic portable temporary latrine structures, you know, our argument from the beginning has been uh, this is actually the most responsible thing we could be doing because there are hundreds of people coming out to the site to take part in uh, Native American ceremonies uh, for different types of gatherings. It's completely legal for those people to come out and visit the site. Um, and if there aren't some sort of bathroom facilities, most of those people don't know how to properly go to the bathroom in the wilderness. So they're just going to go out and do it you know, on top of the soil and just leave their toilet paper sitting there, right? It's disgusting. It's not hygienic. It's not good if you have hundreds of people doing that type of thing. So we saw, we thought, okay, let's do the most responsible thing we can and build this small portable um, temporary latrine structure. It's more hygienic. It's more environmentally friendly. It's minimizing the impact to the land. And BLM didn't like that. So um, they said, you need a permit to do that. And we said, okay, we'd like to apply for a permit. How do we do that? And they proceeded to ignore our question. We actually asked them about permits probably five or six times. And they ignored us every single time. And now they've turned around and said, you don't have a permit. So we're going to fine you $49,890.13 for a trespass at Thacker Pass. So um, uh, it's illegal to crap on federal, federal land, isn't it? <laughs> You're not allowed to open defecate on federal land. I thought that they would fine you for that if you did that. Uh, that's a good question. I think that that might be somewhat up to the discretion of law enforcement. Um, it is legal to go to the bathroom on public lands. Um, in the protocols in many places are around um, are are basically a leave no trace protocol, which is like you dig a you dig a little hole, right? You go to the bathroom in the hole and then you bury it. Um, you know, I think if people are just pooping right on top of the surface of the ground 
um, that they might be able to give you a ticket or a fine for that. Um, that's probably up to the discretion of the officer who, who discovered something like that. Like I have a friend who used to work for the forest service. He was a ranger and he would come across people doing that type of thing all the time. Um, cause people just don't know, right. They just don't know how you're supposed to do it. And, um, and I don't think he would write them tickets. He would just educate them. He would just say, you know, that's not how we do things in the wilderness. We, we bury our poop. It decomposes, you know, it's better for the ecology. It's, it's not gross for other people who might accidentally step on it or just walk over and see it. Um, so it, it is, it is legal to go to the bathroom on federal land. Uh, except apparently it's not legal when you try and do the most responsible thing and, and take care of the uh, waste produced by hundreds of visitors in the best possible way. So you can't put a porta potty on federal land without a permit, um, but can you just dig a big trench and then next time it's just... You know, it's you can, actually... You know, basically build a, a dugout trench. Yeah, the, one of the structures that they got mad at us for, it wasn't even a latrine into the ground. It was literally a five-gallon bucket with a toilet seat on it and two wooden pallets uh, leaned up against each other and staked down with a tent stake so they wouldn't blow down in the wind uh, for privacy. That's it. That's all it was. Uh, and they called that trespassing, right? And they're trying to fine us all this money for it. Um, you know, meanwhile, the same agency has permitted this uh, Canadian mining corporation to come in to destroy almost 6,000 acres of public land, uh, you know, for at least 46 years until they supposedly, you know, start doing reclamation and restoring that land. Um, it's likely the mining operation would go on actually for about a hundred years. And th then we're talking about impacts that would last for hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, and they, they had no problem giving a permit to the mining company for this. So we think it's uh, obviously a very blatant case of um, discrimination and harassment and targeting activists. If they come after us for this very, very minimal impact all of this, keep in mind, all this is already happening on an already impacted area. Um, this was, you know, not a pristine habitat. There are already some dirt roads through this area, and there's already these little parking areas that were created by the mining company and by local ranchers years ago. Um, that's where we set up camp. That's where we built these latrines. We did. We weren't cutting down trees. We weren't knocking over bushes. We weren't destroying. Uh, wildlife habitat to do this we were doing everything on the already impacted land um, and so it's all just pretty absurd um, we think that we're going to continue to fight back against this we're going to take it to an appeals process um, it might end up in in court even uh, we'll see a and i'm not operating under the illusion even though it's so ridiculous to us and to people who are just sort of looking at the issue from the outside I am not operating under the illusion that our courts are sane <laughs> or that they do the right thing. Um, so they might stick this fine on us. That might end up happening. Um, that's just the way it is. Of course, environmentalists and land defenders all around the world face fines and harassment like this. They also face arrest and beatings and torture and murder. Uh, this is the kind of thing that happens to people who try and defend the land is that those in power um, governments and corporations go after them and they target them and they try and destroy their lives in a variety of different ways. And here in the United States, uh, oftentimes outright murder and torture of activists is browned upon, <laughs> although not always. And, uh, and so they, they resort to, you know, dirty underhanded tricks like this. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I think uh, that mines in general, mining companies, um, they go bust. They just fold. I, because I, I knew some guy with a talc mine in, in California, and you can't really mine in, in California because all the regulations are too strict. And so 
what they do is they just mine a little bit until they, they get prosecuted. Then they just close the company and go bankrupt. And then there's nobody to sue. And they just open another one and carry on mining. <laughs> Buy all the assets, carry on mining. And that, that was their practice. And I believe that's how it works in mining. So the chances of them restoring it are not very high because when they finish mining it, they just declare bankruptcy. And then there's nobody to sue when they don't restore the land. Yeah, and you see a lot of similar tricks across these industries. Um, in this case, Nevada is a very mining-friendly state. Um, it was built on mining, mm -hmm. and all the, uh, all the regulations, those few that do exist, are set up to facilitate mining and to make it easy for the mining companies. Um, so unfortunately, in a place like Nevada, um, these, these companies don't really have a problem uh, maintaining sort of legitimacy and maintaining profitability um, within the standards of the capitalist system. So often they don't have to resort to those sort of explicit, um, uh, you know, sort of shortcuts or workarounds. Um, nonetheless, they do end up causing all kinds of problems. One of the most notable in Nevada being uh, an old abandoned mine site called the Anaconda Mine. Um, that mine has polluted the groundwater around it for quite a distance. All the people who live in the region can no longer drink water from their wells. They have to drink bottled water that's shipped in from outside. And it's going to continue that way for forever, basically. The water's polluted. It's done. And, uh, and the mining company has done everything possible to try and avoid responsibility for cleaning that up. Um, and... And that actually included working with the Nevada Department of Environmental Protection to alter scientific studies to make it appear as though the pollution did not come from the mines. Um, so there are cases of these regulatory agencies and the government explicitly working with uh, these companies, working on their behalf. This is actually something with the Bureau of Land Management as well. There was a case in uh, early 2019 where a whistleblower was fired from the BLM in Nevada after he uh, filed a, whistle, a complaint, a whistleblower complaint, alleging that the agency basically is in bed with the mining companies, um, that they're breaking federal law regularly, that they're ignoring environmental regulations. Um, and that they're, uh, you know, just a lackey of this mining industry. Um, so this isn't a, a new story. Um, this is something that has been going on for a long time. Um, and, and people have also been pushing back against it for a long time. But we need more of that. We need more people to stand up and, and say this is completely unacceptable. But can you uh, take another angle? Because it seems like this is kind of the last step um, in, the, in the process of actually mining lithium. And, it, you know, can't you go higher upstream, like, for example, on the consumer side maybe or in the investor relations or something? Because, like, Elon Musk said that, you know, all these lithium companies must be really responsible and restore the land and all the stuff that you know them are going to do. Um, can't you go, you know, to that angle, go, go to like Tesla and try and expose Tesla as being in bed with the, the lithium mining companies and, and say, you know, that this is all a big scam and go for, go for their subsidies and all of that kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I think going the financial angle is important. And we've been working on a few projects in that area. Actually, you know, if either of you or any of the listeners want to get involved and help with things like that, we need we need assistance, um, especially from people who have some experience uh, in the realm of investments in the stock market, in uh, the SEC, the different agencies that regulate these type of businesses and how they function um, to help us intervene and, and get some leverage in those ways. Um, one challenge here is that the Lithium Americas Corporation we don't know thus far where their product is going to go. Um, they haven't signed any agreements, at least that are public, with a specific uh, uh, battery manufacturer. 
And so uh, it's unclear where the lithium that's mined at Thacker Pass will end up. Now, there's a, there's a possibility that it would end up in Nevada because the site is only about uh, two and a half hours, three hours from the Gigafactory, Tesla's first Gigafactory, uh, which is co-owned by Panasonic and is maybe the largest battery production facility in the world. Um, so there's a good chance that it could end up there. Um, but of course that facility is already getting lithium from other sources. They're already cranking out batteries. Um, and so it's unclear, you know, you also have general motors and all these other car companies ramping up their battery production all over the United States and elsewhere in these different factories they're building. So there's a lot of demand for lithium and, um, targeting is a little challenging at the moment. Yeah, but this to it seems to me, if you're in that business, you must be plagued by all these things that you have to get right. I mean, to actually process lithium, it sounds to me that that would be energy intensive. They've got to mm -hmm. find a site to do it. So it seems like you could block them in a lot of ways. Like, um, for example, if you can find out where they're going to process it, you can do a, a similar kind of blocking action and then... Um, if you can find out where they get water, because I presume it's open cast mining, um, and they're going to need facilities, they're going to need electricity, they're going to need water, and it's got to come from somewhere. So if you can figure out where they're going to, the local source of water, I think it's possible to, to go to that local city, and you might get the city on your side so the city wouldn't give them their water. So then, you know, all of these things make it uh, financially more difficult to run if they have to you know bring water tankers in and if um, if they can't get power in and stuff like that it it could uh, make it unfeasible because most of these mines are running on a very thin margin mm -hmm. so if you can find any way of increasing their costs I mm -hmm. think that's um it it really can uh, be quite a good spoiling tactic totally yeah totally and in this case the the Thacker Pass lithium mine actually will include a processing facility on site. Uh, they're going to build, they're planning to build a uh, sulfuric acid plant on site that will produce sul sulfuric acid from sulfur that will be trucked in on uh, hundreds of semi trucks a day, bringing sulfur waste from oil refineries uh, to produce this sulfuric acid that then will be used on site again to process the ore um, into a higher concentration product, um, which is then what will be shipped out. There may be some additional processing steps um, with that product after the fact in order to actually prepare it for use in batteries, but I'm not sure about the details of that, whether it will be shipped out sort of ready to go, um, ready to go into the battery factories or not. But you're exactly right. The the, there is a lot of water required for a project like this. It's actually 4.6 million gallons per day. And that water uh, is, is planned to be uh, coming from the east side of the project where they've dug well a well already. Um, they've acquired half of the water rights that they need from some local ranchers that they, they, they bought the water rights from them. Um, but those transfers are actually still pending right now. And there are some protests against those transfers that people have filed to try and oppose those water rights transfers. Um, you know, keep in mind, this is a, an, an aquifer that is already over pumped every year um, by something like, let's see, um, something like more than 6 billion gallons per year. So, um, to, so everyone understands there's water in the ground and the farmers and the mines and all the other water users are pumping out 6 billion gallons per year, more than is recharged by the rain and the snow and everything else. So underground, the water levels are just dropping and dropping and dropping. So there's already serious water issues in this area. Um, there are some concerns so is, from the utilities. This... Go ahead. Go ahead, Hugh. Is this the Ogallala um, aquifer? No, this, this isn't. So this is in the Great Basin uh, ecoregion. 
And uh, so it's, it's a basin range uh, geography where you have these mountain ranges and then you have valleys in between them. There's actually something like 45 mountain ranges in Nevada. Most people don't think of Nevada as being a mountainous area, but it is. It's in the west. So it's west of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and California is not that far away to the west, a couple hundred miles. Um, and so you have these aquifers in these valleys that are interconnected underground to some extent, um, but they mostly consist of these relatively small drainage basins um, within these areas. And so what are the waste products that come out of this? Because they must be brutal after you've used sulfuric acid. So you use sulfuric acid on the lithium salts and then that's the major chemical process. What, what's the effluent that comes out of that? Do you know? Yeah, well, in this case, it's the lithium is in clay because this isn't a, this isn't a brine lithium deposit. Most of the lithium mining comes from lithium brines oh. where it's pumped out underground from a dry lake bed um, from the groundwater underneath where it's like this salty slurry of, of lithium and salts and other that's, things. Yeah, that's what I've in this, seen. Yeah, I in assumed this case, it was like Bolivia or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, in this yeah. case, it's actually an ancient lake bed, so all that's dried out, and now it's in clay um, in the in the ground itself. So it's a solid deposit, um, and uh, you've got a lot of pollution issues with this project. The company claims that they're going to be using cutting edge pollution control technologies from Dupont Corporation. Um, which, of course, DuPont has never lied to the public or caused any health issues of any sort or deceived anyone in any way. Um, so we can always trust DuPont. Everyone knows that. Um, and all, all their lawyers are covered with Teflon as well. Absolutely. Yeah, nothing sticks. <laughs> and, uh, of course, they don't live too long, but that's beside the point. Um, so in terms there's anybody that uses Teflon. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of the pollution issues, the main issues that are going to come from this mine um, in terms of pollution are the, uh, the material that's going to be released into the dust and get into the air from this facility, which might include sulfuric acid um, and which could increase acid rain and cause other issues. We don't know. Um, nobody really knows until it actually happens and we see what the ramifications are. Um, but it will also include things like uh, there's, there's uranium in the soil. There's other radioactive isotopes. So there's a radioactivity problem. This mine, this deposit of lithium was actually discovered when um, an oil company was looking for uranium. So there's, there are radioactive materials in the soil in this region. And when you dig those up and you blow explosives through the ground, um, those are going to be released into the air, into the groundwater, into the wind, um, and spread across the landscape. Um, you've also got things like antimony, arsenic, different heavy metals that would be released here. Um, and we know from the analysis that's in the environmental impact statement uh, that this mine would pollute groundwater for at least 300 years. That's as far out as the modeling and the projections went was 300 years. Um, so it's likely that that pollution would last for thousands of years, if not longer. Um, now, the mining company has all this good public relations talk about how they're going to manage and mitigate these issues, how they're going to control the pollution using air scrubbers. Um, they're using great technologies like dry tailings stacks rather than uh, wet tailings ponds. Um, which supposedly is safer in some ways. Um, they're going to do things like use a basically a plastic bag underground, a giant buried plastic liner to prevent um, the leaching of these toxic substances into groundwater. Um, all of this is, is managing a problem and it's not solving a problem. And basically what they want to do is create a massive pollution issue and then try to control it as best they can with these technologies that we just know are going to be completely inadequate in all kinds of different ways. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a sham, the whole thing. But who regulates all of this? I mean, nobody's going to come later. The Bureau of uh, Land Management or uh, Mining won't, 
won't come later um, and check that they did all the stuff and did actually do the lining as they said they would in the they're just going to do whatever the basic thing is uh, for the EPA will just make sure that they're not polluting. They won't actually do an analysis underground or anything like that, surely. Yeah. There's you know, some... I mean, the basic question is, how much follow-up is there going to be? I mean, they can say all of this in a plan, but if they don't do one-tenth of it, who's going to yeah. be actually regulating it and prosecuting them for not, not following through? Yeah, there's some very basic oversight from the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level, from the Nevada Division of Environmental Protection at the state level, um, but it's very minimal. Um, the The state of Nevada has two people dedicated for the entire state to going to these mines and checking in on, are they following the regulations? Are they doing things right? And much of what they're checking on is the data that is self-reported by the company, right? They're the, the company is the ones who's running the monitoring systems, who's gathering the data about any pollution releases, who's running the pollution control systems. Um, they can doctor that data anytime they want. They can change data. They can, uh, they can accidentally destroy or lose data. Um, and that happens all the time. The other thing that you see with these type of industrial operations is that they expect to violate pollution control laws and regulations. They, they plan for it and they budget uh, money for the fines that they will get levied um, when they violate those regulations. So they actually, they put that in their budget. They just include it as a cost of doing business. Um, and so, for example, you'll see these mines that get fined $10 million for violating pollution regulations. Um, meanwhile, the mine made $2 billion in profit over the same you know, time period. It's, it's literally not, it's, a, it's pennies to them. It's a slap on the wrist. Um, so unless you have, there, you know, basically these regulations are one, not easily enforceable and two, they're completely inadequate. So um, there's a lot of problems with the whole harm reduction approach of the regulatory system. And ultimately, as many people have said before me, the regulatory system is set up to regulate the public, not to regulate the corporations. It's set up to regulate us and regulate the ways that we can fight back against these companies and the ways that we can try and stop them, um, not the other way around. So is there another avenue through like OSHA and the, the actual employees? Because they must be taking a big hit in terms of uh, you know, the basically lethality index of some of these things they must be working with, not, not to mention silicosis and stuff like that, is, um, I, I mean, I, I thought that one of the reasons why there's so few mines in California now is because of um, the, the workers' uh, health uh, aspects means it's too expensive. You can't, they, mm -hmm. they can't indemnify themselves against um, uh, workers' lawsuits, uh, for wrongful injury and death. Yeah, and I think that sort of thing is very important to, to uh, increase protections as much as possible for labor. Um, you know, the, the labor movement has fought for decades and hundreds of years to protect workers and protect communities from these rapacious businesses. Um, I think one of the issues is that often with those types of debates or those types of issues, you get into... Uh, risk management and you get into the type of situation where it's like, okay, this worker got cancer, but how can you prove that it was caused by, uh, by this mine or by the pollution from um, the, the job that this person worked at? You get into some tricky situations where um, as long as there is plausible deniability on the part of these companies, they'll take it. And um, I think that's one reason I've been, reading through this book recently called The Whale and the Reactor, um, an, an old book by a guy named Langdon Winner that's all about techno, sort of a philosophy of technology. And he talks about the problem with, uh, with using sort of a risk approach to these topics because he says that when you frame things in the sense of risk, um, that implies that there's a reward as well, right? Somebody who takes a risk might be like a gambler who... Um, you know, maybe you're going to lose, but maybe you're going to win big. 
And that's not the reality with these types of situations, because anytime there's a big mine like this, we know we're going to lose. We know workers are going to get sick. We know the community is going to be harmed. We know there's going to be all this pollution, harm to wildlife, all these different issues. Um, that's not a risk. It's more accurately, you know, a hazard or a destructive force or something along those lines. And so even the sort of the framing of the debate in this sense of, of risks to workers, this is something that the companies really actually like, I think, in many ways, because uh, risks can be mitigated risk can be managed, risk can be quantified and, um, and dealt with in all these different ways. It, so right. You can, right. Yeah, you can, you can insure against it and it's uh, part of the business plan. Right? right. And so I think they like that sort of almost engineering approach to these issues because it allows them to manage the problems. Um, you know, in contrast, from the beginning, we've said it's not about it's not about parts per million. It's not about, you know, the percentage chance of harm to, you know, how many people will get cancer in the community over so many years. Um, those, that kind of data is important and it's useful, but ultimately the question is, do we want this mine or not? And our answer is no. <laughs> right. And so they really like to try and frame the debate in the sense of the mine's going to happen. How do we manage the risks? And we like to reframe it as, no, we don't want a mine to happen at all. And that's the bigger question. So uh, the, the American Lithium Company is just a, like a shell company. It was just set up for this project. It, it's not a public company with shareholders that you can appeal to. And the board is probably you know, private, right? You, you might not even know who they are. Is that right? No, actually, this it is a publicly traded company. Um, there's two entities involved here. So there's Lithium Americas, which is a Canadian-based corporation. They are publicly traded. Um, they have investors, public board of directors. Um, and then they have a subsidiary company called Lithium Nevada. And that's a U.S.-based company fully owned by Lithium Americas um, that exists for the Thacker Pass mine. So Lithium America is the larger corporation. They are also involved in another lithium mine in Argentina that is a, a co-owned project with a big Chinese lithium company called Gangfen. Um, that company, that project in Argentina has also been accused of destroying the environment, violating human rights, violating the rights of local indigenous people. Uh, and they're currently building that mine and working to get it online um, to begin production in the next year or two. Yeah, okay. so I'm going to ask a very naive question, so just forgive me for this one. But um, I, just kind of thinking of a devil's advocate, advocate argument for having a mine in America is my uh, assumption is that if it's done in Bolivia or in South America or one of these mines overseas, they're probably much worse of environmental impact with much less regulation. So it's even as light as EPA regulation is, at least there's some comeback. Whereas a lot of these countries, like by the, by the time you're you know, doing blood cobalt out of the Congo, it's just basically you know, packets of money to, <laughs> to some, some warlord. So um, is the argument that say, you know, if people, well, better to have it in America where there's some control and at least some standards than some hellhole where there are none. And I presume, I'm second guessing your answer, but I presume is that they'll, they'll do it everywhere. It's not a question of either or. They're going to do it in America and they're going to do it in every hellhole they can find lithium. Is that the answer or what, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's part of it. I mean, the, the lithium demand is huge and there are analysts who say that there simply isn't enough lithium in the world to meet the demand. Um, if that's the case, and it certainly seems that way from observing the market right now, then they are going to go every single place they can to get the lithium. You know, it's sort of been a, um, an insult to talk about environmentalists as being NIMBYs, not in my backyard. Um, I actually don't think there's anything wrong with being a NIMBY as long as you also understand that 
putting it in somebody else's backyard is wrong too, right? And that's the approach that we've had from the beginning. It's been this lithium mine is a specific issue. We're fighting it because we live here. We live nearby, right? I don't speak Spanish. I can't go down to Argentina and meaningfully organize against a project there. I just don't have that ability. Um, but there are people who are fighting in those communities and we're going to communicate with them, share information, resources, strategies, and try and assist them in their fight as much as possible um, and take part in some of the international coalitions against lithium mining. But I think the the idea that we have such good environmental regulations in this country um, is, for one, it's just not true. Um, it, you know, it may be the case in some areas that we do have superior regulations to some other countries um, that do provide some increased protection. But if we had such wonderful environmental regulations, we wouldn't have an extinction crisis. We wouldn't have a climate crisis. We wouldn't be one of the most polluting countries in the world. Uh, we wouldn't be a, a, a country in which, you know, uh, urban sprawl has destroyed an area the size of Washington state since 1945. Um, we wouldn't be a country in which an area the size of the entire state of Nevada is paved in this country um, and growing every day, every year. Um, so I think the idea that we have environmental regulations that are really good in this country is really more a, a marketing idea than anything that's actually real, unfortunately. Yeah, it's, uh, so this reminds me of like bright green lies, what we're saying is that it, it's really a hard sell to the mainstream culture now and the dominant culture to say, since everybody's been sold this bill of goods, like you say in bright green lies is that everybody's been sold this bill of goods that it's all transition to electric mm. and it's really hooey because we're not transitioning to electric we're just adding electric to an yeah. increased fossil fuel use so basically we're going to increase energy use by 50 percent before 2050 and that's the problem because they're going to take every single source so they're going to increase although they're going to increase wind and and uh, so-called renewables they're also going to increase fossil fuel usage. So there is no such thing as tr transition. It's every every damn source we can get and more. Yeah. And, and so, it, you know, but I think in most liberals' minds, and, you know, kind of say liberal, I mean most environmentally concerned centrist kind, kind of uh, 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 people that are uh, in clans and things like that, they... Um, they see it as this is the answer. The answer is lithium batteries and stuff. Mm. And so it's very hard to tell them, no, your dream solution mm. is, is failing on so many ways. It's not a transition mm -hmm. to this other thing. It's basically, you know, it's just an add-on on top of more fossil fuel usage. Mm -hmm. And so, so where, where do we even begin to communicate this? Well, that's a, that's a hard question. I mean, I think I'm a big advocate for just being honest with people. And, you know, I, I'm not really interested in just smashing somebody's worldview and sort of just destroying their sense of self for my own gratification or anything like that. Um, so, you know, the question is, how do you really change somebody's mind? And, it's a challenging question. Often I think it comes more down to values. Like so often we're having these debates using numbers and rational arguments and all these different things. Um, but more fundamentally, there's something deeper going on under the surface, you know, about what, it, what do you value? What's important to you? Um, what are the stories and the narratives that you've been told and how do you see yourself in those? And so I think that we need the information, we need the facts, we need the science to back up what we're talking about. Um, but I think more fundamentally, we need to help people shift their values or recognize the values that they do hold um, and how they conflict with what they're actually talking about and actually promoting. Um, so, you know, I guess I could just share one example. We have a woman who's involved in the Thacker Pass campaign who, um, 
six months ago was promoting electric cars as the solution to the, the world's problems. And she got involved. She saw what was happening up here and started to come up and visit the site. And, you know, the, I think that what convinced her is partly the land itself and partly just being exposed to people who are going to sincerely talk about these issues, right? And have a serious adult conversation and not just be flippant and not just communicate with snarky memes and that type of, you know, internet lingo, but actually, um, actually explain the issues in detail and in depth and, and talk through it. And I think I understand that a bit personally, because when I was 15 years old and reading mainstream environmental websites, I thought lithium batteries were part of the solution too. Right. And so my mind has been changed over the years and, um, I think we can all change and sometimes that process takes time. Um, but I, I try to appeal to people's better natures. You know, I think, I think most people are legitimately good fundamentally in that they, most people don't, you know, walk by a stranger on the street and think I want that person to hurt or have a bad life or be in pain. Right. <laughs> I think most people are generally relatively friendly and, and, uh, you know, given that, I think we can work with people's better natures and talk honestly about the, the consequences of our actions, um, the realities of these types of situations. I mean, the, our whole goal with the book, Bright Green Lies, was to, um, you know, one, provide information to people who already agreed with us and who just needed, you know, data to help back up their arguments but two was to try and reach those people who do value the natural world, who do love the non-human nature all around us that we're a part of. And yet bought into the narrative of green technology because it really seemed like the only game in town because that was just the air they breathed, right? It was the water they swam in. And so we wanted to just provide a living example of an alternative, um, something that people could aspire to, could look to. And um, yeah, it's a challenging question. I, and I think the, the right answer to your question here really depends on the per specific person you're talking to. Um, you know, usually when I'm trying to change somebody's mind... Person by person. Yeah, when I'm trying to change somebody's mind, usually it's very individual and oftentimes it's not about um, achieving a massive change all at once. Like this person believes a right now and I want them to believe Z in five minutes from now. It's more about, okay, this person believes a right now. How do I get them to B? How do I get them to C? How do I get them to D? Like, let's just take one step at a time and just keep moving in the right direction. And that doesn't mean I'm going to lie about what I believe or, or cover up what I actually feel. Um, but just trying to be relatively gentle with people about it and understand that, um, that it takes time to change our minds and that as much as we wish that we could just snap our fingers and people's minds would change, that's not how it happens. And, and sometimes when we alienate people, um, that's that, um, that actually backfires right? When we try and jump all the way to Z right away, that actually backfires. And we just get people saying, oh, you're a snob or you're stuck up or they're, you know, uh, whatever. And so I, a big part of it for me, just my personality is just trying to be nice to people and just communicate as a human being. Um, I think people respond to that and, and um, I don't know, go from there. I wish I had all the answers. Yeah. Getting people to see is a problem. They don't want to be, and you won't get them to see. So the, um, the, that issue is coming up with Extinction Rebellion now because they're doing this um, uh, Insulate Britain action, which is really blocking M25. And so okay. it inconveniences everybody, and they're getting a lot of hate mail now. And 
so it's what you're saying that you know gets people's backs up. And I wonder the question I got is they getting called eco fascists uh, by pretty well, basically the kind of Murdoch pre press. And I'm wondering is what's your feeling about when we we all have to get eco fascists? Aren't we there yet? Where we have to just say. Forget about what these people think. It's time to just get eco-fascist. And then at some stage, surely they're going to say, look, if there are people out there that really, really do believe this enough to go and do eco and stuff like that, then they, they might at first start off thinking, oh, this is a, an assault on my way of life and everything that I am. But eventually they're going to see that there's a you know, they're kind of on the wrong side of this battle. As, uh, is that you can never go go to the dark side. You always have to be nonviolent. You always have to be nice. And, you know, you know, we've had so many decades of that, and it's not getting anywhere. You know, it's like in the climate uh, activists in the UK are getting, you know, they're going backwards in the, in the UK. Mm. And I mean, in the U.S., it's, you know, it's it's kind of it seems fragmented to me. But what what's your thoughts on that? Is about just going for eco touch? Yeah, I think you know, I try to be non dogmatic about things. Um, I think that there is a lot of uh, mainstream nonviolent activism that is incredibly ineffective and um, silly, frankly. <laughs> and I think there's also a lot of sort of underground or militant action that is just as silly. Um, I think that it's a mistake to look at any one tactic or technique and say it's inherently effective simply because of its nature. Um, I think everything has to be assessed in context. And we have seen throughout history sabotage being used very effectively in different contexts and also being used in, in pretty frivolous and stupid ways in different contexts, right? Um, you know, one example would be like Ted Kaczynski's bombing campaign against people. Frankly, I think that was pretty dumb. Like, I don't really think it achieved anything. Um, you know, the, the guy got some notoriety out of it. Um, you know, and, and Kaczynski, I haven't read much of his stuff, but like, he, I know he's a critic of technology and a critic of some, has some ideas that maybe I would agree with. Probably a lot of people would agree with. Um, and a lot of people sort of think that he came up with those ideas, which is totally wrong. Of course, they were existing well before him and, and hundreds of years, thousands of years before he came around. Um, and there are many other traditions as well. So I, I think his actions were kind of stupid, which is ironic given that people say he was some sort of genius with a super high IQ, but it just doesn't seem like um, what he did would in any way lead towards the transformation of society that he was seeking to achieve, right? Um, now, on the other hand, I think you can look at some um, completely nonviolent campaigns and see a lot of effectiveness playing out. You know, you look at the civil rights movement here in the United States, obviously it didn't solve all racism forever. But if you want to talk about the material change in people's right in people's lives that came with the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act and these other laws, uh, changes in the law, they were massive, massive changes to society. And that was achieved largely using nonviolent means, not entirely, um, you know, I think a lot of people ignore the fact that Martin Luther King's house was full of guns, apparently, because people tried to blow up his kids. And, you know, uh, he had death threats all the time and he was killed. Ultimately, somebody shot him. Um, so um, I think that it's I think that there's a continuum of action. It's more of a spectrum than a definitive um, line that you can draw and say you're either on this side of the line or you're on that side of the line. And I'm interested in what's going to be most effective in any given circumstance. Now, if we're talking about 
defending the planet, stopping the burning of fossil fuels and those types of things, then I think that there's definitely a place for more serious militant actions like eco-sabotage. They can no doubt be an effective means of shutting down those types of industries and destructive practices. You only have to look at, for example, um, the, in the actions of the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta in Nigeria um, sabotaging oil pipelines. They knocked out 40% of the oil production in the largest oil producing state in Africa, one of the largest producers in the world. Um, no mainstream nonviolent environmental movement has come even a fraction, uh, you know, come to even a fraction of that level of effectiveness stopping oil production, right? Um, so I think that we sort of need a full spectrum movement and I, I am all in favor of smart and disciplined militant actions um, that are taken in a larger context. And I'm in favor of smart and disciplined nonviolent actions that are taken within a larger context. Um, and I think that what we need to avoid is people just lashing out because they're angry and they're upset and they don't know what else to do. Um, because I think that type of action, sometimes it might be useful, but I think when it is useful, that's more like just random chance <laughs> rather than like they planned it out and they had a really good strategy. Um, so I think that needs to try and be avoided as much as possible just because it's, it's likely to backfire in some very non-useful ways in, in many cases. Yeah, so um, one has to be kind of careful when talking about Ted. But um, from what I know, he, his motivation for actually doing his bombings was purely to get his um, manifesto published. Mm, so okay. that, that was his only aim. So he actually succeeded in what he tried to do. So people argued whether that was necessary. But I, I think it's hard to debate that you would never get that, um, that manifesto into the public eye. It's, it's completely unpublishable. But he got it published in all the, the major newspapers. So, so I would say his, uh, his tactics actually worked, as brutal as they were. And you can argue about whether it, it was worthwhile doing the manifesto. But uh, he would be unknown, and his manifesto would be unread. So he achieved his aim. The, um, if you read his latest book, the, the um, thing... The anti-tech revolution, the why and the how, it's very easy to download in PDF. I recommend you read it because he's, he, um, his vision for, for actually fighting back is um, really um, uh, it's a kind of, uh, how would you characterize it, Sophia? It's kind of lone wolf rebellion, right? Yeah, that's what I read, yeah. I read through the that last book, yeah. Yeah, but he, he, la he lays out exactly how a disciplined campaign would work. And, it, and um, yeah, it's, it, that was his aim. And so now there are more and more people starting to think that way, so starting to think that he was right. And they're gathering steam. Yeah. Yeah. That was his later writings in prison. And you know, it's a, it's it's a very good thing to read. It's very dense. Mm -hmm. um, it analyzes a lot of the attitudes of the environmental uh, movement at the moment too, and it's the left, the place of the so-called green, and of course the mitigation and the subject that you have approached in your fantastic book. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, it's it's yeah, it's well worth reading from a man that has spent then now he's written that about 20 years after being in jail or 15 20 years so it's it's seasoned it's seasoned very well and it mm. Mm. so yeah just on on his sources i just read something recently about who his sources were so academics credit him with all sorts of fantastic sources because really he kind of co-evolved his thinking to come to the same conclusions so they assumed he had read all these, you know, Mumford and stuff like that, which he hadn't. Yeah. And so this latest thing that I read said that his, he really only had one major influence, and that's this uh, Lul, Fre this French guy, uh, guy called Lul. It's what, what's his first name? Sophia, come on. Jacques Ellul. 
Jack mm. Elu, yeah. The Jack Elu. Yeah, who's that? So, yeah, yeah. Christian non-violent um, ex-resistant who looked who protected Jews during the occupation and who was a very active man in helping youth in his area in France and also uh, a defender of the all the coast of the southwest of France and he took personal physical actions to defend the environment but mm. he was powerfully anti-technology and uh, wrote a very interesting book that were not very publicized uh, though in those years and he influenced uh, Ted Kaczynski immensely apparently mm. interesting yeah I've, I've heard uh, I've heard his name before and I think I've flipped through some of his work a little bit so I'm familiar with it but it's kind of interesting you know, my own grandfather was a conscientious objector during World War II. And so it's kind of interesting how uh, this um, political tendency towards nonviolence can evolve over time. Like what, okay, yes, personal nonviolence. Um, what does that mean when there's larger societal violences being enacted? And what does it mean to take the moral choice to stop those? Um, what's what's right in order to do to do that and I think you know I don't have all the answers to those questions but I think that those are some of the most important topics we need to be discussing right now and they're just not being covered at all um, I I found it really interesting recently read a book called the ministry for the future by Kim Stanley Robinson he's an American science fiction writer and this book is a uh, it's climate fiction, essentially. So it starts around the year 2025 or 2030. And the event that kicks off the, uh, the narrative of the book is a massive heat wave hitting India, killing something like 20 million people because the wet bulb temperature is exceeded. And uh, there's power blackouts and brownouts and so on. And millions of people die. And the, the, the book... Uh, plays out over the next 20 or 30 years after that and looks at it's basically a speculative fiction about how the future might play out as climate chaos intensifies but one of the points that you see playing out in the book is that as a result of this indian heat wave you see the emergence of a very militant indian uh, resistance movement uh, that engages in sabotage and targeted assassinations of people involved in these highly destructive industries. And they're essentially making the argument that these people are responsible, these people and these businesses are responsible for killing 20 million people. And, um, and we're going to hold them accountable if nobody else is. And we're going to make sure that it stops. And morally, it's pretty hard to make an argument against that. And I think that is the reality that we're in and we're increasingly moving deeper into. Um, and as far as like the specific moral questions of any specific action, you know, that's, that's a conversation to have, but I think that people need to start grappling pretty quickly with these really serious type of questions, because this is the world that we're living in now. Um, the stakes are really high and they're only rising. Well, it's it's all about yeah, defining yeah. what is crime again. It's all it's all about turning things upside down and on their heads, um, and and that's that's also the, the the conversation we need to have with people, and and um, and uh, stop calling um, drug dealers, for example, drug dealers, but for the pharmaceutical company or the states mm -hmm. that are sponsoring those companies are drug dealers. Stop calling uh, the um, people who are attacking banks uh, b robbers because it's the people who have the banks that are you know it's I'm, I'm just doing very childish examples there but that's the sort of language that we need to shift that we need to communicate to people who are living in this dream in this dreamland now and and maybe we can avoid this this bloodshed that we're talking about 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 retaliation and assassinations of of responsibles people have to suddenly realize where are who is the enemy who is the, who? The, the whole definition of, of crime has to be has to be a, a taught in schools. Uh, you know, it's it's just we're we're totally in la la land. <laughs> what you're fighting at yeah, the moment, so, oh, yes, fighting at the moment, you are you, you you know it's and I hope that we 
I mean, in our little group, I don't know what we can do when we try to broadcast this as much as we can. But what what you are doing there is is I mean, you you're portrayed as the villains with your little toilet, with your little latrine, latrine thing. No, but do you know what I mean? It's just, and you will be portrayed as the villains for forever until people start to make a shift in their definition of what is a villain. Yeah. Do you know? And and that's a question of story of language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in, in my story, in the, the, the climate fiction book that I did, um, I also put in that Indian story with the wet bulb um, temperatures going over 50 degrees and, and basically making a mass die-off. And what I had happening after that was not, um, well, so much an insurrection, but the, the danger I see coming out of that is geoengineering. Because I pegged India as one of the countries that would would resort to geoengineering under the under catastrophe situations. So in other words, under political pressure because of something like a wet bulb uh, die off in Pakistan or India, both of those Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan they they ride in the crosshairs for that kind of catastrophe and mass die off. And they're also well capable of starting to do mass ge uh, basically solar radiation management, putting sulfates yep. in the upper atmosphere. Both of the air forces could do it. And um, it, it, you know, it is military technology. So the way I, I, I keep on saying, I've said this to you before, and I've said it to, to Derek and Lierre as well, is that I think to me it's very obvious how this unfolds. And you can see it happening... Um, right before your eyes with this IPCC AR6 uh, report is if you look at how The Economist responded. Uh, the AR6 report, I would say, was just a manifest geoengineering. It's just, it was just geoengineering from top to bottom. And The, the Economist magazine, which is you know, basically the, the biggest spokesman for globalism and uh, the you know, industrial economy that there probably is, uh, they they had a, an article complaining, saying that it's outrageous that it was not in the summary for policymakers. They said geoengineering was not mentioned once in the sum, summary for pol um, policymakers. And you could see what they, they were saying was, you know, geoengineering is now a must. And that's where they're all going. They're all going to this position where they're saying, look, solar radiation management will work. We can control the weather, and then we don't need any of this transition. We can burn fossil fuels as much as we like, and that's where we're going now. You can see us barreling forwards, but nobody even knows much about solar radiation management and, and geoengineering, and those that do ha are strange bedfellows because some of the, the, the people that are really, you would think are environmentalists and kind of tree huggers, actually say, well, I think we, we're going to get to geoengineering. And they have an idea that geoengineering is feasible, it's responsible, and doing research into it is actually something that uh, it would be irresponsible not to have that in our back pocket and know how to do it in an emergency. Um, and I think most scientists are thinking that too. They're thinking, well, no one wants to do this, but we things are getting so bad we need it in our back pocket and i think it's the exact opposite if things are that bad we need to de-industrialize at an emergency rate and not uh, resort to geoengineering because for a number of reasons um which maybe we should go have another call about if you're interested in mm -hmm. but i'll tell you in yeah. great detail and, and give you a number of uh, references of, of why geoengineering would be absolutely fatal it yeah. would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. We we would go extinct. It's really just making it's doubling down on the problem. So it's basically we're saying we completely screwed up the planet with engineering and industrial society. Let's double down, <laughs> and it's it's yeah. It, it basically it would extend our our species lifespan maybe a few decades, um, but the end result would be absolutely underlined human extinction. It's a it's a fascinating one for me because it literally sounds like a 
super villain in a comic book, doesn't it? Like we're going to block out the sun, you know, <laughs> some sort of some sort of, you know, Batman villain or or Spider-Man or something like that. It it literally it sounds insane. It, it and is. It it is. And, and I think it, it is this this no, but this 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 guy called called Ken Caldera and David Keith, they they work for La Lawrence Livermore uh, Laboratories. So, so yeah, yeah. the first thing to know about geoengineering that they keep deathly quiet is it's military technology, and these guys have patented all these things like um, solar radiation management with Bill Gates. Uh, Bill Gates is named on these patents, and what they, they um, it. This guy really is a str Dr. Strangelove. He, he, he's on record, uh, uh, this um, Keith, David Keith guy, he's on record as saying, now that we have all the patents for all of this stuff, when the world is forced to use it, we are going to make money like nothing else. So he to become so rich by having the, the world's thermostat patented. And and so that's their agenda. And that guy Ken Caldera, he were, he's also on. There's a YouTube thing where he was at a conference, and they caught him. You know, maybe he didn't know he was being recorded, but they asked him about his work at Lawrence Livermore, and it's outrageous. It was all about you know how to um, detonate a hydrogen bomb that would cause a high tidal wave to take out a big city, and he said he, they did lots of work on that. Eventually, came back and said, well. Just drop the hydrogen bomb. It's easier than making a tidal wave. He said, but all the other stuff he did was climate engineering. He says, you know, weaponized climate engineering is far, a uh, far more practical thing to look at in terms of, um, you know, kind of mass destruction weapons. And he said, we looked at something quite feasible, and that's that you get a cloud, you seed it with pathogens, uh, make sure that it goes over some large territory like the Soviet Union in this case. And then you seed it to make it rain the pathogen out. He said, that's quite feasible. But all of these guys came from climatized weapons research, and, and that was all used in Vietnam. So all its history is, is uh, geoengineering. And the strange thing is that the very first report to a U.S. president about the dangers of climate change was to Lyndon B. Johnson. Um, and it was in... Yeah, it was Lyndon B. Johnson, but, but they they warned him about the coming climate catastrophe and global warming. And they had only one solution, and that was, they said, we've got to start geoengineering. We've got to start climate control now. They had nothing about mitigation. They had nothing about reduction of, of CO2, nothing of that. No transition, no, you know, renewables, nothing. They just went straight to... CO2 is going to be going up, so we have to start geoengineering. And so it's obvious that's where we're headed. And I would say, you know, the conspiracy theorist in me says, that's why they're not doing anything. They know mm. <laughs> they're pushing us into this corner where we have to start geoengineering. Yeah, and I think one way that you could look at the whole lithium and electric car stuff and the, uh, the renewable energy technology stuff is that it is to ecological collapse as geoengineering is to global warming, right? It is a, not only a completely false and inadequate solution, it actually makes the problem worse because it doesn't recognize the underlying causes of the issue. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more that geoengineering uh, would be an absolute disaster, um, it would backfire in terrible ways and, I think you're right that um, countries like India might consider that or might might launch their programs. And actually in that Ministry for the Future book, that's exactly what happens after the heat wave kills 20 million. Um, I'd love to check out your book sometime, Hugh. Um, but uh, it, the same thing is postulated in this book, that they start running geoengineering campaigns. The Air Force gets up there and starts blasting aerosols into the upper atmosphere um, and, you know, in this situation, it, in, in this um, fictional context, it's relatively short lived and small scale. And so it doesn't end up causing in the in the fantasy world of the book doesn't end up causing 
massive issues, which I think is also um, very possible that things could play out like that. Like there could be geoengineering at a small scale carried out by certain countries that then they're forced to stop because of public outcry or some negative um, ramifications start to become apparent. And so they realize, okay, shit, this actually wasn't a good idea. Um, that's a possibility for how things could play out as well. And that happens in the book as well. But I think you're right. It's kind of like, it's one of the Hail Marys of, um, of an industrial civilization that's fundamentally destructive is, you know, how do we keep this thing going? Um, and I think we really have to watch out for it. Just the fact, just the fact that they are seriously talking about disrupting the flow of sunlight onto the surface of the earth, um, betrays such a fundamental lack of understanding of ecology and of photosynthesis and the earth's energy balance and how weather is formed and how weather patterns operate and the importance of sunlight for, you know, from something as small as human health to as large as, um, you know, photosynthesis of the entire ecology on the entire planet. It's just a nightmare. These guys, these guys are psychopaths. So they've worked all of this out. So they say that uh, they would block out the sun 3%. Basically, the solar forcing would would be about 3% less. So however many watts, I can't remember what the wattage now is for solar forcing. But um, it, anyway, it, it would drop by 3%. They've also calculated that that would drop all of... Um, all of vegetation on Earth would be reduced by 3%, and all of agriculture would be reduced by 3%. So if you think about it, in that sentence is hidden a genocide, because I don't know how many people are living right on the edge of the, the breadline, the United Nations breadline, but there they must be maybe, I would think a lot, millions and millions, maybe a billion people that are right just above the breadline. And, or 3% above the breadline, and they would be pushed below the breadline. So in other words, it means that hundreds of millions of people would die with that 3%. But they factored it in, and they're saying that's fine, because they've also done models of seeing where the warming would happen and where you can actually see these things, and America comes out better. They've said, actually, that in their modeling, America's agricultural production actually goes up. China, India, and South America get devastated. <laughs> but it gives you the idea of where we've headed with this. It's basically, it's politically charged. But, but here's, here's the thing that I want to present to you, is I think in all of this is the, the argument we've been looking for. Because it takes a long time to change people's minds. But most people, I think, are not so crazy that they think geoengineering is a good idea. Mm. So if you frame the whole argument as geoengineering is coming, we have to stop these psychopaths. Then mm. I think we have 80% of the, mm. the population on our side. Mm. And so all these guys mm. who are really transhumanists and engineers and have this tech bent, they are actually, although they're very vocal and they have a big space in all the press and the science press and the popular science press, that they are actually a tiny minority of the world population and their thinking is very minority. So if we force the whole issue into the fact that it's, you know, geoengineering against deindustrialization, most than most people. So if, the mere fact that they want to take the you know climate action into geoengineering, I think, is how we win. We just have to keep on camping that up and saying that you know the the we just have to frame the debate around you know where we headed is geoengineering. Do we want to do this? And then everybody will think, no, this is going crazy because it, it exposes how crazy these idiots are. Mm -hmm. And it sets up these. Um, you know, it sets up a divide where we win. Basically, if if you characterize us as the tree huggers, and this is you know tree huggers against rocket scientists and Elon Musk cult, 
then and lithium batteries and everything, then, then we win because the vast majority of people are tree huggers when you start talking about geoengineering. Most people are savvy enough to say, this is crazy. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just see a message there from Max saying that he's going to have to go very shortly. So we might want to wrap up now. Oh, okay. Um, I just want well, to talk, well, I, well, I just have a, it, the name of the book you mentioned is The Ministry for the Future. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. Ministry for the Future. And uh, maybe we, Hugh, you might send Max a link to your book, um, St. George and the Methane Dragon, because it's a, it's a nice little story. I think you'd like it very much. Yeah. Okay, Max, yeah, thank well, you very I'll much. Check it out. Thank yeah. you, Sophie. Thank you, Hugh. Thanks I appreciate so it. Yeah, let's let's get on the phone again sometime soon and continue the conversation because there's a lot to talk about, and I I really enjoy hearing hearing these ideas and talking about them with you. Well, hopefully we can make your we can spread a little oh, bit. Keep up the good work. You know. Yeah. yeah keep up the good work, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Max. Bye. Okay. Bye. Take bye. care. Bye. Bye.